Greetings and welcome to How Microbiome and Diet Affect Your GVHD. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. You can submit a question throughout this webinar by typing them in the Ask a Question field on the left side of your screen. A question and answer session will follow the presentations. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, press star zero on your telephone keypad if, connect if connected by phone. If you're connected on the webcast, click the question mark icon on the upper right corner of your screen. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the conference over to our host, Jennifer Gillette. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you so much, Diego. Yes, my name is Jennifer Gillette, and I'm the staff social worker at the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. It is our absolute pleasure to bring you today's <laughs> program about microbiome and diet and how that affects your GBHD. Uh, today's program is brought to you by a collaboration between Insight, the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, and Pharmacyclix Janssen. Just so everyone knows how our presentation will go today, uh, we are very honored to have Dr. Marcel Vandebrink, uh, who will speak about microbiome health and his research, and then Peter Adentori, who will speak to you about nutrition and GVHD, and then I'll give you a few tips after them to discuss how you can cope with GVHD, and then we'll open up the floor to questions and answers. Um, just so you know, uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, if you're kind of new to this kind of technology, there is an area that you can type in questions, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can today, but you can do those throughout the presentation. Uh, for those who might not be familiar with the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, we are uh, dedicated to helping individuals and their families from diagnosis through survivorship. We work with hospitals, cancer centers, and other organizations to reinforce and complement medical care by providing resources, support, and education. We link you to experts across the country in all topics related to transplant, transplant and to others who have made it through the journey before you. If there is anything we can do to give support to anyone on the call today, uh, feel free to reach out to either of those emails. Peggy Burkhardt is our executive director, director, and my email is right there as well. And so some of the resources we have for you. Uh, first of all, we have our Lunch and Learn programs, our podcasts, multiple webinars and blogs from those who have been through the transplant process on all things related to transplant, including disease-specific information, survivorship issues, coping, and symptom management. We have a wonderful peer support mentor program uh, where we connect uh, not only patients, but caregivers, even donors with others who have gone through that process. We have our second birthdays recognition program, and we have many resources, books, materials, and offer people emotional support. And here on the left here is a picture of our uh, newest updated book, our survivorship book, which is available. And if you're interested, you can reach out. We'll be happy to send you one. And I also encourage you to check out our Facebook and Twitter pages. Um, we have a lot of great information and support for people there as well. A special thank you to our webinar event sponsors. And of course, we always wanna thank our partners because we could not do the work we do without them. Just a little medical disclosure today. The highlights are we are giving you great medical information, but you have an individualized medical plan with your doctor, and we encourage you, if there's information that you are interested in incorporating today, that you discuss those with your physician. Now, I will introduce our speakers. Uh, again, we are so honored to have Dr. Marcel Vandenberg. Um, he is a physician scientist and medical oncologist who performs both laboratory and clinical research related to allogeneic bone marrow transplantation and immuno-oncology. He is the head of the Division of Hematologic Malignancies at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and holds a joint appointment in the Immunology and Transplantation Program of the Sloan Kettering Institute. He is the co-director of the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy at uh, MSKCC and is the chairman of the board of DKMS. 
an international nonprofit organization devoted to bone marrow donor registration. As a clinical scientist, he is involved in immunotherapeutic trials of cytokines and cell therapies for patients with hematologic malignancies. His laboratory is devoted to the immunology of BMT, and he studies immune re reconstitution, pathophysiology of graft versus host disease, intestinal microbiota, and the chimeric antigen receptor T cells in patients and preclinical models. Both as a division head and a laboratory principal investigator, he mentors junior faculty members, hematology oncology fellows, postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, and undergraduate students. And then we also have with us here today Peter Edentori. He is a clinical research dietitian with the Adult Bone Marrow Transplant Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. His research focuses on optimizing patients' nutritional status after transplant, and he conducts patient care in both the inpatient and outpatient settings. The National Bone Marrow Transplant Link also thanks him for being supportive of our mission and for assisting us with previous programs. He is a true advocate for patient care, and we have nothing but respect for him. So Dr. Marcel, it is, or Dr. Vanderbrink, I apologize. It is time for you. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure, it's really an honor to be able to um, tell you something about some of the work that we've been doing over a decade uh, or so now. And I would like to emphasize that Peter is part of our whole uh, program. So these are joint uh, studies that we've been doing, trying to understand what is the role of the human microbiome specifically for the outcomes after an allogeneic bone marrow uh, transplantation. And we'll emphasize a little bit what the role could be for graft versus host. So just to get you started, um, what is the human microbiome? Well, it's all of the microbes, so those are bacteria, fungi, viruses, that live inside and on our body. Um, so to say it in a little bit more trivial way, a lot of what we're doing is we're studying a poop. So it's a little bit unfortunate that this was scheduled as a lunch meeting, so I hope I don't spoil your appetite here. To give you a little bit more background about what we have learned so far, and certainly over the last 15 years or so, there has been an enormous interest. There's been a boom in the studies looking at what is the impact of the microbiome. So things that we have learned, first of all, is that those microbes are as many, there are, you have as many microbes inside and on your body as you have cells within your body. And they really live in a, a symbiosis with all of your body organs, with all of the features of your normal uh, physiology. Um, most of the microbes, most of the flora, we will find within your gut. So that's also where most of our studies are currently are. And that's where we know more at the moment. But we're certainly interested also in, for instance, trying to find out what is the role of the skin flora in a lot of uh, processes that have to do with health and with uh, disease. Um, I hate to break it to you, but at any moment uh, you carry about four to five pounds of uh, bacteria um, in your body. And these uh, bacteria that we're dealing with, um, there's about 10,000 10, or so, uh, from which each of us chooses about 300 to 400 that make up their specific micro, microbiome. Um, and that will be relatively constant during your lifetime if you're not changing your diet, if you're not changing drugs, specifically if you're not taking any kind of antibiotics. So that's sort of your own uh, special micro, microbiome, which is really uh, unique uh, to you. Now, over the last decades, uh, for sure, maybe a little bit longer even, we've learned that the impact of changes within the gut flora is not just about what happens with your gut and with, let's say, irritable bowel disease or with, an, um, with, with other kinds of uh, diseases that have to do with your liver or with your gut. But since these uh, bacteria make all kinds of uh, products that can get into your bloodstream, their impact is on every organ. And on most uh, diseases, one can find that there's some role for changes within the gut flora and its products. 
uh, metabolizes what we call those call those products. So that is a very um, uh, sought after area of a study, and there are many labs and many scientists uh, looking at it now. We've been looking over the last decade or so, and some other groups also, at some of the most critical outcomes after an allogeneic transplant, which I portray here in a rather morbid way as what are the causes of death after an allogeneic transplant, and how can changes in the microbiome have impact on that. So just to summarize 10 years or more of work within this field, you can make a cladogram, a map of all of the different uh, bacteria that you can find uh, within your gut. And then based upon all of these studies in mouse and men, you can start to label them. Red if they are linked to a bad outcome, blue if they're linked to a good outcome. So now we can start to fill in this map. And what this also uh, teaches us is what kind of uh, bacteria should we spare, should we uh, promote, maybe put into a fecal transplant if we're going to do that and which one should we try to uh, suppress. Um, now, most of these studies that that was based upon were rather small ones within a single center, maybe with 70 or 80 uh, patients or so, and that was it. So to see if we can get some better data that is more uniform and uh, universal, we were very fortunate that we were able to uh, team up with some colleagues from all over the world and now do a study that we recently published where we have almost 1,400 uh, patients. All of these patients went through an allogeneic bone marrow transplantation for the typical reasons for which we are doing that, so AML, NDS, um, and so on. And then what we saw there was, first and most of all, if you look on the left side there at all of these dots, um, then you can see that the dots have colors that are based upon if the stool sample came from a patient from one of these four centers from, uh, from where we were collecting stool samples. And it should be obvious that it's rather random. It's not that all of these dots cluster somewhere. So what that tells us is that actually at the start of a bone marrow transplantation, where we expected that maybe the flora from a Japanese patient would be different than a German patient. That's not what we found. Everybody started with fairly similar uh, dispersed uh, flora. And we think, and we basically know based upon some other studies, that that is because most patients going into a transplant have already incurred damage to their flora. And why is that? Because almost everybody has gone through a year or longer of chemotherapy, bouts with fevers and, and, um, and neutropenia for which they were treated with some antibiotics, and many other drugs that can impact on the uh, composition of, of your flora. No matter what, when we start with the allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, and that's that other graph with the four lines, you can see that each line is the average of the diversity of the samples from a certain center. And what should be obvious is that the diversity in all four centers, in all of these patients, immediately upon the day that they come into transplant starts to drop. And it starts dropping already prior to the actual day of transplant, which is marked on the x-axis with a zero. So this loss of the uh, diversity is very uh, profound, happens in every allogeneic bone marrow transplantation uh, patient, and uh, we have studied that in great uh, detail, so we know now what kind of uh, bacteria are actually specifically lost. And we know also that patients who incur an even greater loss of the uh, diversity during those first days, the first weeks after allogeneic uh, transplant, that they have worse outcomes. And it is, again, specifically linked to a greater risk for lethal graft versus host. And we can get into some of the mechanisms why that is uh, later. But that's probably the main thing that I want you to get out of this. Going into a transplant, your flora is already not really normal, and it gets rapidly worse during the course of an allogeneic transplant. 
and in data that I'm not showing here, we've also seen that even a year out from an allogeneic transplant, many patients have not really uh, recovered yet to the pre-transplant state or the pre-treatment before the transplant state of their floor. So what are the factors that impact so much and, and make you lose the uh, diversity within your flora? Well, the most obvious one is, of course, the use of antibiotics. Um, and we'll get to how we can work with that to maybe make that damage uh, less. But it's much more than that. It's also a conditioning regimen, right? If you start with an allogeneic transplant, you get some chemotherapy, antibody therapy, maybe some radiation. All of these factors have negative impact on your flora. And then, of course, the one that we're going to highlight in this series of talks is diet. Uh, we know that if you uh, change, your, change your diet, within 48 hours, you can see already that your flora changes also. Um, so that's a clear reason why um, it's very relevant to study that in much more detail, much more detail than what we know now, and to look at that as a way to have hopefully positive impact on the diversity within your flora. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that recent studies have indicated that almost every medication that you take, a pain medicine, a nausea medication, or whatever, uh, that that can also have impact and change, change your flora. So we need to be very mindful of any kind of medications that we're taking. So thinking that through and now looking at the gut flora as something that we would like to use as a target for therapies, for better outcomes, um, then our first goal, as hopefully you got out of these previous, uh, previous slides, is that we want to keep it uh, diverse and want to specifically spare all of the normal bacteria, we call that uh, commensal bacteria, within your flora. So how can we do that? Well, we can categorize the different strategies in four blocks. The first one is probably the lowest hanging of fruit of all of them, and that is smart and wise use of these types of antibiotics. They come in many different flavors, and there are certain types of antibiotics that do much more damage to your, um, to your uh, commensal flora than others. We have shown both in mouse and men that if you have a choice between a broad-spectrum antibiotic that does or does not do damage to the ecumensal flora, that going with the one that does more damage to the ecumensal flora is linked both in mouse and men to a greater incidence of lethal graft versus host. So we really would like to get to a point that the choice of antibiotics is not just directed by what kind of uh, pathogen, what kind of dangerous bug do we want to kill, but also how can we choose one that spares your normal flora, which we don't want to kill. Um, so we're doing a trials now to really uh, prove that that is uh, relevant, and others are also looking at that. And we've seen already a change at many centers that they will use the, these types of antibiotics more sparingly and will try to avoid the ones that hurt your own flora. A second strategy is in the right top corner there. It's called pre, prebiotics. And what I mean by that is um, it's, again, basically diet, the kind of nutrients, the kind of food that you take, and how that can promote, keep your flora healthy. There are certain types of nutrients that these are commensal bacteria like, so you want to specifically give them those kind of uh, food uh, products. Peter will get to that. The third category is the one in the right lower corner, which is labeled probiotics. Now, that is where, and I will get back to that, that is where there's a lot of action at the moment. People trying to take certain pills with bacteria in it, fecal transplants, and so on. We'll get back to that one in one second. Uh, the fourth category is in the left lower corner. We have labeled it postbiotics. And what that basically is, is uh, based upon studies, what kind of products coming from your own flora might be healthy, might be relevant to uh, preserve a certain bodily, a bodily function, you can start to think like, okay, even if these uh, bacteria are maybe uh, missing, maybe we can give that a uh, product. 
A typical example of that is short-chain fatty acids. It's a whole uh, category of complex types of uh, sugars, carbs. Um, and we can give them uh, directly in some cases if we notice that, for instance, a, a patient doesn't have that many uh, bacteria anymore that under normal circumstances would generate these kind of short-chain fatty acids. Butyrate is one of the ones that many people are currently focused on. So let's take a deeper dive in what I told you about probiotic therapies. So um, the most uh, famous type of pro, uh, uh, sorry, of probiotic therapy is of course fecal transplant. So that, as you can see, goes back already to 1500 before Christ, when people uh, described that as a way for dealing with all kinds of illnesses. Uh, Chinese in the 4th century literally used what they called a yellow soup. I'm sorry again if you're having lunch. Um, and used that for food poisoning, uh, for instance. In the 17th century, there were fecal or transplant strategies used in Italy for, uh, for certain diseases, specifically in, um, in uh, horses and in uh, cows. But what we're currently focused on are these fecal or transplant for a specific type of uh, infection, uh, C. diff, and that goes back already to the 1950s, but some recent studies have really indicated that if you have um, recurrent bouts of this uh, C. diff and you've been through several rounds of uh, treatments with antibiotics, that actually at that point a fecal transplant is better than trying a third or a fourth at a time with another type of antibiotic. So that is really why that field is currently um, um, interesting for many uh, biotech and pharma companies to see if we can uh, come up ways uh, can uh, come up with ways to do smart fecal transplant not just for a C diff but maybe for other diseases also. Um, so the probiotic therapy, of course, finds its origins with this guy, Eli Mechnikov. He is the guy who really studied lactobacillus. He puts him, um, he basically put uh, himself uh, for years on every day drinking a glass of sour milk with live bacteria. This is why we have all these yogurts all over the world in every uh, in every supermarket. A lot of that really came from his work. Uh, he wrote this book, Prolongation of Life optimistic studies. Um, unfortunately, he died shortly after he wrote that. But this is where all of the interest in lactic acid uh, bacteria comes from and why there are so many uh, yogurts at the moment. The health benefits of many of those are still uh, questionable because in most cases, no real studies were done where people really uh, compared is this healthy or not. Meanwhile, this has turned into an enormous industry with 30 billion of annual sales. You see two of the bacteria that are specifically uh, promoted in many of these products. I want to emphasize that the FDA is not really uh, controlling this. All that they're doing is, um, is making sure that it's relatively safe, that it's not toxic directly for a patient. But they don't ask for any proof, like you would do for a drug, to really demonstrate that a certain therapy, a certain pill in this category is better than another one, or no pills. Um, so none of these should be categorized as real therapy-proven uh, drugs. Uh, they're all most in the food supplements um, category, which means that it's just about not being directly uh, toxic, and that's about it. And I want to emphasize, if there's a second thing that you get out of this uh, talk, uh, that although in every health store there are, I don't know how many pills that you can buy that claim that they have healthy probiotic uh, capacities, that it actually can be very, very dangerous. And I'm uh, telling you this story here about um, uh, immunotherapy of cancer, where it was demonstrated in a series of articles in this journal, uh, Science, that changes with it within the gut flora could have impact in how well this therapy works for certain cancers, such as lung, lung cancer and so on. 
So there are currently trials going on where people are trying to give these healthy microbes that they think will have positive impact on this therapy for those cancer patients. Meanwhile, since this was advertised everywhere, many, uh, many folks have read this, what um, some of the centers who were doing these kind of studies found is that a lot of patients on their own were going to health stores and were buying these kind of pills thinking like, oh, if microbes are good for my cancer therapy, why don't I buy some and, um, and start taking them? One scientist analyzed this and actually found that that, have a, that that had a clear negative effect. So it gave patients who were doing on their own a pro, probiotic supplement therapy a 70% lower chance to get benefits from this um, immunotherapy. So, um, so that's the second point that you will hopefully get out of this. These probiotic therapies and pills are not safe, they're not um, innocuous. They actually, in certain circumstances, can do more harm than any benefit. Because going back to my first point, the major uh, thing that we know at the moment is that we want to make sure that your flora is as diverse as possible. So then trying to come with one bacteria in whatever pill form or whatever and try to uh, disturb that is not a good thing. So with that, um, I'm going to just summarize what I've been trying to tell you, that what we have learned over the last decade is that specifically for patients undergoing an allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, that we see a lot of changes within their flora and that we can link them to pretty much all the clinically relevant outcomes, overall survival, lethal graft versus host, bacteremia, sepsis, engraftment, relapse, and so on. I've also tried to tell you what are the major factors, the major variables that can have impact, the use of drugs, specifically antibiotics, but diet, and we'll get to that in our next talk, and the conditioning regimens. So with that, I want to, of course, thank all of my uh, funding sources, all of the various agencies that are supporting uh, this work, and all of the people within my lab. Uh, too many to mention here, but Peter is one of them, and I'm going to hand over to him now uh, to tell you something about diet. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Marcel. Let me just pull up my slide here. Okay, so hi, everybody. Um, Marcel has given me a nice introduction here. And so my name is Peter, and I am a research dietitian at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, I work in Dr. Brandenburg's lab um, and also broadly on the bone marrow transplant service. So I'm going to take a little bit of um, what Marcel has tackled in the area of microbiome and really extend it to some nutrition implications. So what I'd first like to talk about is um, really how I'm going to structure this. So just um, as a starting point, GVHD is a very complicated and complex thing for us to treat because it's a very individualized response um, and there are very um, individual uh, considerations that we need to consider for each patient. So what I can emphasize here is that you should be working with a dietitian and an interdisciplinary team who can really help tackle uh, GVHD both when you're in the hospital and you get it in an acute phase and also when you get it when you're at home um, in a more chronic phase. So what I'll talk about first is how might you be able to decrease your GVHD risk um, before it could possibly happen, so in the time point before transplant and immediately after transplant, um, some symptom management that nutrition can help with during an acute flare of GVHD. Um, and also some chronic symptom management as well, trying to give you some practical tips. And so as I mentioned, um, there's really this team approach and individualized management, so I can't stress that enough. So I'm going to give some general recommendations, but for specific recommendations that would help you should you unfortunately contract GVHD or currently have GVHD, um, one of the most important things you can do is really work with a broad team um, to really tackle some of these symptoms. 
So um, lots of my patients ask me this uh, when they start their transplant or before their transplant is they've heard this buzz about GBHD and they're very nervous about it and how do I prevent it and what can I do? And so what I tell them is uh, this. So first, what we know available right now is that poor oral intake, so poor intake of food through your mouth, um, leads to an increased risk of both acute and chronic GBHD. And so maintaining your intake um, in adequate levels, and you can speak with your team about what that means, um, and maintaining your weight during the transplant process are important ways that you might be able to decrease your risk of getting GBHD um, throughout your transplant process. And so um, that's not so simple. So many of our patients um, in the transplant process have uh, a hard time maintaining that intake. They may have this loss of appetite or just not be so hungry. They may get nauseous, which may cause them to vomit. Um, there may be some diarrhea that's happening. Uh, your mouth might feel some dryness, um, and you might have some taste changes that happen. So all of these things are making it a little bit more complicated for you to maintain your oral intake throughout your transplant process. So um, a little plug for my colleagues around the country is that dietitians are really vital to your transplant process. And what our expertise is to really help you maintain that intake and really um, navigate those symptoms that you're having. So really it's a team approach between us and you as the patient to really get you through um, some of these symptoms that might be happening. And it's a major reason why I focus so much on symptom management in my part of the talk here. So a little bit of uh, what I like to say to my patients is try to keep calm and eat good food. Um, there's plenty of people out there that will tell you some good, some food is good food and some food is bad food. Um, and what I tell my patients all the time is there is no such thing as good food and bad food during transplant. The most important thing that we can have you do during this period of time is to really maintain your weight and maintain your intake as best as possible. And that may be achieved by eating foods that you would otherwise think might not necessarily be the healthiest for you. Um, and so really adjusting those expectations can really help you to maintain your weight throughout the transplant process. And so um, how do we achieve that? So some of something that many dietitians will tell you when you're going through the process of your transplant is to intake small, more frequent meals and snacks. And I give my patients a target of every three to four hours to eat something, whether it be a little snack or a meal, a smaller meal, or whatever they can intake. And having them focus on foods that are a little bit higher in protein and foods that are higher in calories whenever possible so that each one of those bites that they take packs a little bit more nutrition into it. And, um, you know, to put a caveat in here, there is no true way that we can prevent GBHD right now. So I use that word cautiously. Um, and really what we can do is we can decrease the risk. But unfortunately, we aren't at the point with our science where we truly understand how to prevent GBHD from happening. Um, and of course, that is a big goal of both um, my research and also that of Dr. Brandenbrink. So um, just to draw a quick connection here between what um, Marcel was talking about and really what I'm talking about here is um, how these things are connected. And so um, some of the data that I've collected under um, Marcel's lab is that um, we know that alpha diversity, which is one of the ways that we measure how uh, diverse your microbiotal colonies are, um, so it was something that Marcel talked a little bit about, is um, what we know is that that decline happens way early on here. So if we focus here on the time point from what we have in the bottom uh, part of this graph, day minus 10 to day zero, this time before your transplant, that decline in your diversity happens quite quickly. Um, and it's something that we are focused on, focusing on in our institution and really zooming into to say, okay, how can we mitigate that and how can we make that a little bit easier for our patients and maybe make the curve not as prominent? And so what you'll see here is that's the decrease in your microbiotal diversity. Um, and from our nutrition data, we also see calorie needs, um, calorie needs met, meaning how much of a percentage of your nutritional needs are you meeting over time, also declines with a very similar pattern. So likely that has led us to a hypothesis that possibly diet is a very important part of this. Um, this equation here saying that, you know, the decrease in your calorie intake can really impact that microbiota diversity. And so that really looks at the quantity of foods. And also what we have here on the right-hand side is more at the quality of foods. So one of the ways that we can measure quality of foods 
similar to uh, diversity of bacteria is by uh, diversity of food. So um, looking at different diversity of food from different food groups, such as fruits, vegetables, protein sources, um, dairy products, sweets, and desserts, and things like that, we can really look at how diverse of an intake are these patients um, intaking. And as you can see, this draws a very similar curve to what we're seeing overall. So not only are patients eating lesser amounts of food, but their diversity of food is also dropping quite prominently um, in their pre-transplant process and then staying quite low. So here there's a question of should we be promoting more intake of food um, overall to increase that calorie um, intake, or also should we be increasing just diversity of foods and um, a wider variety of foods being intaking? Um, and so this is some of the open questions that we are trying to tackle um, at our center, and I think we yield some really interesting data on how we can really um, intervene on the microbiota and improve um, our uh, ability to decrease the risk of GBHD. So um, you might be asking, if you haven't read so much about GBHD, is what of my organs might be affected by GBHD? So where might this um, happen in my body? So this nice picture here shows some different areas of the body that can be um, tackled by GVHD. So it could happen in your eyes, your mouth, your esophagus, which is really that throat that um, connects your mouth to your stomach, uh, in your lungs, um, in your liver, in your upper gastrointestinal tract, which starts with your stomach, your lower gastrointestinal tract, which is your colon and your small intestine, and also can happen in your joints and your fascia, which is kind of at your you know, elbows and knees and your shoulders, um, and also all in your skin as well. Now, we think about all these different organs and you say, well, Peter, there's a lot of different impacts that can happen here. Which of those might actually impact my ability to take in adequate nutrition? So what I've done is highlighted those here. So in our mouth, um, in our more chronic GBHD settings, um, we may get some mouth sores and you may have some significant taste changes and dryness um, that can impact your ability to intake nutrition. In your esophagus, um, you might have some trouble swallowing, um, plus or minus, meaning with or without pain. So some patients just have some issues swallowing, some have swallowing problems, but also have some pain there in your upper gastrointestinal tract, uh, which includes both your stomach and your pancreas. Um, stomach is more impacted in um, acute GVHD with your pancreas really having more impact in your chronic GVHD. Um, but you might feel some nausea, vomiting, and some uh, reflux, which can also be heartburn. Um, in your lower gastrointestinal tract, you may, uh, which impacts both your small and your large intestine, you may have some diarrhea, you may get some cramps, um, and abdominal pain in general, which um, can be very uh, alarming for some patients. And there are some nutritional strategies that can help to alleviate some of those symptoms. The last one that I'll mention here is your lungs, which of course we don't think of from a nutritional perspective, but um, your lungs and the increased work that you need to do for breathing and to really help to um, keep yourself uh, active will impact um, your nutritional needs overall, and therefore you'll need to be intaking a little bit more nutrition at that point to help heal those lungs. And so um, I'll start by talking about these two sections here, about the upper and lower gastrointestinal tract, as these are quite common um, organs that are affected by uh, acute GVHD and are frequently talked about um, in the nutrition community as having a big impact on your nutritional status. So to give you first a definition, so when we're talking about acute GBHD, um, there's a little bit of a, a debate in the literature about really when this starts and when this ends. But as a general rule of thumb, it typically might start around your day of engraftment, uh, which would happen around day 14 once your neutrophils start to come back in um, and your body starts to try to accept that graft. Um, and then it the period of um, acute GVHD generally ends around day 100 um, after your transplant. However, there are some different um, caveats to that that aren't quite within that uh, time frame. And so I'm going to talk about a couple different organs here. So first, um, the stomach is uh, some of the major symptoms you might receive is uh, what we call gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is a fancy term for heartburn. So really what that is is that your stomach contents here, it looks like water in this picture, but it could be you know, a variety of different foods. It could be a little bit of stomach acid. Um, usually it's blocked by this um, sphincter, which is like a little 
um, button more or less on the top of your stomach that prevents that acid from going back into your esophagus and really making you feel that heartburn. So when you're having more of this um, reflux, that, uh, that little button is loosened a little bit and there is a pathway then for that acid to get back up into your esophagus, which can cause lots of that um, pain that is uh, similar to heartburn. And so um, in addition to that reflux, you might also feel some uh, loss of appetite um, and nausea. And so I have some tips here that might help you primarily with the reflux, um, but also can potentially help with some nausea and some loss of appetite is to avoid any foods that are triggering um, that nausea or that reflux. Uh, there's kind of a, a, list, a large list of foods that can help with reflux, but again, that's a very individualized thing. So not every patient experiences the same types of symptoms um, that cause the nausea in the reflux. So it's important to work with your dietitian to help you figure out uh, which foods are triggering for you and which foods might be, um, be able to be okay, even though it may trigger other patients. Specifically with your reflux as well, um, you know, many patients that are in the hospital are eating in bed um, and are feeling not so well, so they may eat whatever they can and then lay back down uh, shortly after eating. And it's important to um, not lay down for at least 30 minutes after you eat to give your body some time to empty some of that food from your belly and go down into your intestines. Um, and if you don't do that, then you'll feel some of those reflux symptoms. It's also, for all of these conditions, helpful to focus on just consuming small portions at a given time, especially if your appetite is not so large. Sometimes eating a whole meal um, can be very uh, intimidating for you, so having this smaller meal will be helpful. And focusing on foods that are a little bit more bland and a little bit with less odor um, to not exacerbate uh, and make worse some of those um, nausea symptoms that you might be having. Um, on the other end of the spectrum here, and this happens more in our chronic graft disease, but it can also happen sometimes in our, our, uh, our uh, acute GVHD as well, is symptoms of gastroparesis, which is now the, the food contents don't necessarily go back up um, into your, um, it, the, the issue is not inherently with the top of your stomach, but more in the bottom of your stomach. So now food really just gets caught in your belly and it just gets stuck there. And that's really how I explain it to my patients is that um, now it's a little bit challenging for you to get that food out of your belly. So again, your small portions will be helpful there um, so that there's not too much food in your belly at once. Typically focusing on some of our lower fat foods if that's the symptom that you're having uh, because the foods with higher fat may be stuck in your stomach for a little bit longer. Um, focusing with your a little bit higher calorie, higher protein liquids because the liquids will be able to go through your stomach a little bit easier. Um, and monitor for symptoms of bloating. So if you get some bloating, um, that you know that gas and that pain in your belly that um, feels like you're kind of uh, having a, uh, a blown up abdomen, if you will, um, really may cause some discomfort. Um, and you'll want to make sure that you are adjusting your portions and the types of food you're eating accordingly as well. And there are also some medications that your doctor can give you that can help with really moving that food um, and beverages out of your belly a little bit easier. Now, when it comes to our intestines and our colon, um, there's not really a best practice per se for managing diarrhea and things like that in this, com in this uh, case. And really, it's, it's based on how bad um, your symptoms are. So if it's very, very severe diarrhea, um, the standard uh, approach there is to really try to give your bowel some rest. Um, and so there's a type of nutrition that we give through your, um, through your vein called parenteral nutrition or TPN sometimes called, which is just allowed to give you nutrition while also not really putting nutrition through your vein at that time. So this is one of the cases where we may be using that if the diarrhea is very severe um, to really make sure that you're maintaining your nutrition as best as possible during that time. And now when your diarrhea is improving, uh, we still initially want you to follow a fairly low fat diet, low fiber diet, and low lactose diet as to not really make that diarrhea worse. Um, and a lot of folks will call that the BRAT diet um, I have in quotes here, which would stand for bananas, rice, applesauce, toast. Um, so this is really our standard kind of diarrhea diet, if you will, uh, to really help patients with feeling uh, more comfortable um, and hopefully decreasing the amount of diarrhea they're having each episode and how often they're having the diarrhea as well. So now let me turn over to chronic graft versus host disease, which typically happens after day 100. So you figure about three months um, and a little bit more time after transplant. 
Um, and so these are symptoms that uh, may come on at that point. So um, in your mouth, you might get some of these uh, sores. So this is, um, you know, they're, they're called sometimes canker sores, for example. Um, they are these ulcers that happen in your mouth, and they can be quite painful. So for patients that have these ulcers, um, you really want to make sure you're adequately using pain control. So that could be medications. It could be some nice mouth rinses, things that really keep that pain under control. Avoiding your spicy and acidic foods, things like citrus, um, and also your hot temperature foods that may just make that an unpleasant eating experience. Um, and leaning more on your softer foods, cooler foods, and some of your liquids that may be better tolerated at this time. And many of my patients also lean on either um, liquids such as uh, milkshakes or smoothies or our oral nutrition supplements such as Ensure, Boost, or products like that um, that will help to alleviate um, the stress of uh, chewing and eating um, large meals uh, that may be more challenging when you have these, this pain in your mouth. And so when we're talking about um, other things that can happen, if you think about your tongue a little bit, is you may get some dryness, which is this picture on the right-hand side where that tongue doesn't have as much coloration. Um, and you might also have some taste changes. So there are some mouth rinses that are available that can help to really lubricate and keep that mouth nice and moist. Um, you want to make sure you're maintaining your hydration status. Uh, using foods that have sauces, um, fluids, and maybe gravies as well. And if you're having um, these taste changes, sometimes increasing salt and herbs and making things more flavorful than you usually do will help you kind of navigate over those um, symptoms that you're having. And the other that I'll talk about here is your esophagus. So you see your normal esophagus is, um, is not red and not irritated when here in, in cases of esophagitis, um, it can get quite red and irritated. Um, and you can also get something called scleroderma, which is a hardening of the um, esophagus as well, which just makes it more difficult to swallow. So there's not as much pain per se, but there is a little bit more of the um, difficulty with swallowing due to the hardness of that tissue. And so in these cases, um, you may also want to go for softer food, sometimes more of a pureed food like a soup. Um, you want to also control your pain very well. Um, again, looking for cooler foods or fluids, um, that might be helpful. Having smaller portions um, and also avoiding your laying down after eating because of the rawness of this esophagus. And for my last slide here, um, I want to kind of talk about some complications first and then some other considerations for GBHD and chronic. So, um, Something to also remember with chronic GBHD is that it may not happen um, at a low grade and consistently. So there may also be some of these acute flares of GBHD, which is really like you have this basic chronic GBHD, but then you have some acute flares where those acute symptoms get very intense. Um, so these symptoms may be worse. So your diarrhea might get a little worse. You may be very nauseous. Um, you may have more of that, uh, those oral um, sores in your mouth. Your skin may look a lot more rashy, um, and so there's things that will uh, be a little bit more alarming to you. And so the adjustment of your symptom care um, may adjust accordingly based on the severity of those symptoms. And thus, the symptom management during those acute flares is very similar to acute GVHD. So in chronic GVHD, these are things that would not necessarily happen in acute GVHD. Is, um, it may impact your pancreas function a little bit. Um, which will make blood sugar control a little bit harder, so you may have hyperglycemia um, or high blood sugar, and you may require some digestive enzymes because your pancreas does both control your blood sugar and how well you digest your proteins, your carbohydrates, and your fats, most notably your fats. Um, so you may be able to, um, may need to take a couple of enzyme pills um, that will help you to digest the fat in your diet and therefore have a better quality stool. Um, you may also have issues with chewing, swallowing, oral intake, either from that um, actual mouth um, challenges with your uh, dryness or also from actual things in your esophagus. Um, and so you'll want to work with your doctor and the speech language pathologist if you have trouble swallowing so they can see what consistency of food and fluids would be safe for you to intake. Um, and also if you're, on, if you're losing weight um, consistently and unable to meet any intake, um, you would want to talk with your doctor and your dietitian about maybe needing a longer-term tube feeding 
um, to really help you get through some of those symptoms. So this is not something we use in all patients, but it is something that is a kind of tool in our toolbox to help you um, if you have a significant challenge maintaining your oral intake because, again, that weight loss is very um, consistent with a really poor outcome. And lastly, something that's very important is to remember bone health can be related to um, your chronic steroid use, and steroids are one of the first medications that we use for treatment of graft versus host disease. And so you'll want to ask your doctor about getting regular bone scans, which is called a DEXA, to check in on your bone health. Um, and you're going to supplement with um, calcium and vitamin D, uh, typically together, um, when needed, and that you can work with your doctor and your dietitian to know what the appropriate dosing is for you based on where um, your vitamin D levels and calcium levels are. And also, um, for bone health, participating in regular physical activity as much as possible, especially resistance training, has been shown to really help with that bone health. So those resistance exercises can be weight-bearing exercises or body weight exercises that can really help to um, put some pressure on those bones and keep them nice and strong. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer to talk a little bit about coping um, and close that up. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, this was amazing information from you and Dr. Vanderbrink. I definitely learned some new things today, and I appreciate you being here with us. Um, so yes, forgive me, I'm just opening up my slides here. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am the staff social worker at the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, and I also do private practice in Michigan. Uh, I manage the oncology social worker services at Providence and Assyrian Cancer Centers, and I have over 20 years of oncology uh, patient services experience, both outpatient and inpatient. And I am here at the link to help you with resources and emotional support. Okay. So in my presentation, I always like to pull from people who have actually been through it. Um, so what I am bringing you today, I want you to know comes from years of listening to those who have made it through. And one thing to keep in mind is there's no one size fits all answer. It's often a highly emotional experience. So there's no cookie cutter way to do this, but you can try on some of the techniques that I talked to you about today and see if anything just helps you feel a little stronger, a little, just a little more like you or what you wanna be as you're going through this. I hear from people all the time, I thought this transplant was supposed to make me better. And that frustration that they got through one thing and now they're dealing with another. But you know, keep in mind, no one knows how a transplant will affect your body. So you're taking a risk to hope for improved health. And many of these symptoms with GVHD, if you talk to the professionals, they'll either be greatly reduced or go away over time. Um, if it doesn't, certainly that can complicate your coping, uh, but it, that's why it's important to have a really good toolbox in dealing with things. We need to have a realistic view of what coping is though. It takes time for your body to heal and so it also takes time for your soul to heal with this. It's figuring out how to get through what's in front of us, um, sometimes moment by moment in a way that doesn't destroy hope and that you just keep growing um, stronger. You have to remember that you've survived a personal earthquake, which required an increased tolerance for the unknown as you walk with exhaustion, consistent pressure, grief, loss of identity, relationship changes, loss of control, and GBHD can cause distressing symptoms that can make you feel discouraged. Now, living and thriving with chronic, uh, chronic graft versus host disease. First of all, to find out to live the best version of you. It's making the best of what your body can do, finding ways to cope with those tough moments, and then minimizing your emotional distress. It's finding ways to reconnect with the world around you in a way that's meaningful for you, and it's establishing a renewed sense of meaning and purpose in your life. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna be experiencing grief because many people were happy with the way life was before this disease came along, but it, it doesn't mean that there's not hope for still finding beauty. I think of that quote by Anne Frank, you know, even with all the misery in the world, that you still can find beauty. It is walking in balance with persistence, patience, hope, and acceptance. And it's also 
getting to know others around you that are going through this. If you attend conferences and network is you look for solutions, you just never know who you're going to run into who has that idea, or I call it the secret sauce, you know, and that's going to be different for all of us. Um, I know a lot of times when I was at the cancer center, I would talk to people and the big three things I would hear is attitude, support, and faith were their pillars, but pillars might look different to someone else as they cope. Uh, just so you know, the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link has a fabulous chronic graft versus host disease book that has all kinds of tips in it, as well as we have a great video um, called The New Norm that is, many patients have told us really helped them start as they were trying to figure out how to deal with chronic graft versus host disease. But the important thing is give yourself time to figure out what your new norm is going to look like. It takes at least a year, even five after a transplant, to know really what's your energy going to be moving forward. Um, what are some of those other things that are going to be different and how your body has responded after. And sometimes there might even be little tips along the way. Like I remember us interviewing um, uh, Kristen uh, Fiara from the Cleveland Clinic, a nurse practitioner, and she was talking about at their survivorship clinic, sometimes they'll even prescribe like Ritalin, um, which is an ADHD drug, but it helps um, give people a little boost if they have a special day. If they take it every day, their body gets used to it. But let's say you have your daughter's wedding coming up or some other special event and you are just really struggling with fatigue, that sometimes they'll even give um, medication to assist uh, with special days. It's also learning how to reclaim areas of importance in your life while allowing for flexibility and creativity. I, I remember some beautiful stories I've heard over the years on how people have adapted to these really hard challenges. I remember a story of a man who used to love to make pies. That was a way he would re relax after a hard day at work. And, and as, after he finished his transplant, he just didn't have the energy to do that. But then what it turned into is he and his wife would do it together. And she would bring him some things to help him do as much as he could at a table, but then she also assisted. And so it transformed into a us activity instead of a just him activity. Um, another uh, client I think that I met over the years, uh, I remember her telling me she didn't feel like a mother anymore because some of the things she couldn't do. And I asked her, I said, what are one of those things you really miss? And she said, I, I always used to do my kids' laundry, but I can barely walk right now. And they had a first floor laundry, and we had her husband get a cart that she could kind of walk with and at least start the process downstairs and have the family take it up. And so, again, it's reclaiming pieces of what was really important. And, um, and then, of course, understanding that everyone loves you, walks this journey with you, and if they're standing beside you, uh, they're not going to mind taking their laundry up. I'm sure they're just happy that you're there. So on to some more concrete tips from some of these amazing people I've met over the years. One of them is Jen Barish. She is a wonderful volunteer for the link and a survivor. Jen recommends keeping a list of the gains you make so you have something to reference when you feel discouraged. You know, like maybe maybe you could just walk a house, um, but then write down when you're able to do two house lengths or three house lengths and see that you are getting stronger. Jen also learned how to adapt with the changes she noticed in herself. Like after she went back to work after her transplant, she was noticing it was really hard for her going up in the elevator and what that was doing to her sinuses. And her doctor helped her find a nose spray that made it much easier for her to adapt to that um, difference in elevation. She worked in a really tall building. Uh, walking around the office once an hour and resting her eyes from the computer were important. And once she was strong enough to return to work, she modified it um, to make it still doable. She didn't have quite the schedule she did before. Jen was one of the people that highly recommends the new normal video, which is available um, on YouTube and our website. And she also shared how important it was to see the recovery as a marathon and not a sprint. 
And here is the lovely Meredith Cowden. Uh, Meredith has also done great work and is a survivor. And um, one of the tips we got from her is discover what time of day your body is at its peak and try to schedule what you need to do during those times. So like even appointments and things, if you know there's a certain time of day that you're crashing, um, you know, try to schedule your appointments around that. And then of course, allow yourself breaks. Um, your body's just not always gonna do what you want it to do. So making sure you give it breaks and prioritize. You know, the thing about fatigue with cancer that is different than someone just being tired is no matter what you do, you might take a nap and not feel refreshed. And that's not your fault, but you can realize what is in your energy and prioritize it. Um, and then try to break bigger tasks into small tasks. One of the things I love Meredith shared is becoming the own, your own author in life. She said, you can't control what's happening, but you can control how you are responding to it. I know she was a big fan of Brene Brown. And um, one of the stories I have for that over the years, we have a lovely volunteer, Rhonda, who had told us after her transplant, she did whatever she could to feel a little stronger every day. Like when she was in her bed, she felt more weak. But when she was sitting in a chair, she noticed that she felt stronger. So every day, she made herself sit in that chair a little longer and a little longer. And this same woman is one that has now run 50 marathons, one in each state. Um, so her method definitely <laughs> is amazing. Um, I know it's not everybody's story. Again, there's no cookie cutter for this, but um, Rhonda definitely understood the, the mental component in overcoming GBHD. Meredith also recommends discover what brings you meaning, joy, and hope. And of course, give yourself time to do those things. And now the lovely David. David's also a survivor. And one of the things he recommended was finding ways to stimulate your brain, uh, like learning a language or crosswords, and look for positive, uh, the positive. Find ways to be social, even on the transplant floor. Um, you know, another tip along the cognitive is making lists too. It's very normal for you to have chemo brain or, or some cognitive slowing. And so giving yourself some tools to help you succeed if the brain's just not triggering at the rate you're used to uh, can help you overcome some frustration. David was also big into exercise and high quality foods instead of junk foods. He actually volunteers with a program in California now that um, uh, assist cancer patients in getting good nutrition. Uh, and when able, get involved. He helps others by going through the journey now. He's one of our peers and, and talks to people about his experience and how he got through it and answers questions and things too. He says, except life will never be the same, it is different, but increase the quality of your life. David was in corporate America and you know the typical American running many directions at once and, and now he's really living a life of passion. That volunteer work and um, doing the nutritional work, trying to help people to heal uh, is something that just really gives them a sense of purpose every day. He said, fatigue is no joke. Get the rest you require and it helps you to get more done. If you keep pushing yourself, and I know I've heard this from several people over the years, if you push yourself past your limit, it could totally change the next few days for you. So really learning what your limit is and just respecting that in your body. You can consider counseling. Uh, there's a lot of great techniques and um, people that are very qualified to help you heal in that department. And consider talking with someone who's been through it. Peer mentors are available through the National Bone Marrow Transplant link. And if you reach out to me, I'm happy to connect you anytime. And tips from Lou. He viewed his transplant as a recall to life. He and his wife were a team that had an attitude of whatever it takes to fight this, we're gonna do it together. He had a strong support team and he tried to choose projects to distract himself. He attends support groups, senior groups, and stays active. And his wife and he enjoy walking together and participating with an app called Charity Miles, um, 
which has large corporations which will donate to charities of your choice by the level of walking you do. Um, I also understand that you can even do like a, a bike with that and everything too or running, but it's a way to just help motivate you uh, to do those types of things. So really, if we had to sum up coping with GVHD, you can't stop the wave, but you can learn to surf. Um, that's a quote from Joseph Goldstein. And so, you know, we can certainly work with our healthcare providers to try to change and minimize, but it's also, we have a choice on how we're going to adapt and um, what is in our control. So now we are going to get to the question and answer portion. Just so everyone is aware, it looks like um, we do have a fair amount of questions already. Uh, if you have not put in a question, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there should be an area that you can type them in, and we will certainly get to as many of them as we can today. So starting out, I think we can all probably say the answer to this first question, but I'm going to ask Peter this one. Peter, Tom asks, I have a transplant in a month. Should I start talking with a nutritionist now? Um, I think that the answer that I will give, I may sound biased, is yes. I think it's never too early to start talking to a nutritionist um, or dietitian um, about all that you um, will experience during your transplant and really um, thinking proactively about it as a great idea. I figured that would be the answer, but thank you for saying it out loud. Um, let's see here. Oops, sorry, I'm scanning a little too fast here. All righty. Uh, another one from Janine. How do immunostimulants such as vitamin C play a part in GVHD? And is it true that if we are taking immunosuppressants that we should avoid taking vitamin C because it would have the opposite effect and make GVHD worse? Any thoughts? Do you want me to take that one? So I think the real truth is that we don't even know if a vitamin C does anything at all to the uh, immune system. Uh, there are no clear studies that have indicated that. Um, and you're going to hear as an answer to most of the questions that are following, because I had a little look peek at them, uh, that the main thing that Peter and I advocate will be make sure you have enough calorie intake and a, a diverse diet to promote the diversity within your flora. I think that's sort of the caption for all of this. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, I'm glad you got a chance to peek. Um, well, what about this one? How to change my diet while on corticosteroids um, for GVHD? You know, sometimes patients hear to be careful of sugar and things like that. Is it recommended to avoid sugar and animal fat while on those steroids? Peter, do you want to take that one or do you want me to tackle that one? Um, I'll take it. So I would say during the use of corticosteroids, um, I wouldn't blanketly say you should avoid sugar and animal fat um, exclusively. So there are some folks that are at higher risk of contracting um, steroid-related diabetes or may have diabetes ahead of time. Um, so there are some adjustments that maybe you can make to make sure that you don't have this very high blood sugar all the time, um, but a strict avoidance of sugar and animal products are not necessary. And again, the level to which um, you should be restricting should be minimized when you're going through this treatment um, because of the needs that you have are a little bit elevated during your GBHD flares as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, Christina writes, I take prophylaxis, including antibiotics, um, and it looks like a sulfa, while being on steroids. How do I improve my microbiome? I know about a specific laboratory that can talk tests for microbiome and supplements the good bacteria based on individual laboratory results. Would such a treatment even make sense? So I would be very careful. First of all, there are no CLIA-approved tests at the moment um, that one can really use to get a good measure of your uh, flora. And the second answer is even if you have it analyzed, and I know that there are labs that offer that, 
they cannot in good faith really tell you, well, this is what you need and this is what you don't need. I would be very uh, reluctant to go with any of that kind of data. Um, but no matter what, when you take sulfur, it will have some impact on your, on your flora. That is true. Fortunately, less than some of these broad spectrum antibiotics. I think those are the ones that really do damage. Um, so I go back to what I said earlier. The main thing is to supplement your diet with a diverse uh, composition of all of your meals. That is the key thing that you can do to keep your flora as healthy as possible. And then, of course, uh, discuss with your doctor if he has carefully looked at the dosing schedule. The dosing schedule for sulfa can be varied and can sometimes be brought down a little bit to, for instance, Monday, Wednesday, Friday only. So in that way already, you can uh, use the antibiotics a bit more sparingly. Uh, kind of a follow-up to that, doctor. Uh, is there an antibiotic that's considered the least harmful? Uh, well, all of them and all of the drugs, or most of the drugs, as I mentioned, can um, induce some uh, changes. Uh, but, for instance, one that is fairly regularly loo uh, used as a, a prophylaxis is ciprofloxacin. And so far, although it does have some impact on the flora, we haven't seen that much harm from it. So that's probably one of the ones that if you have to take an antibiotic, um, that's one where we have at least some data that it's not directly linked to a major increase in the risks for, for instance, a graft versus host. Okay. And, and one person asked, does it matter if it's pill or IV? It's a very good question. Um, so for most of the antibiotics, um, when you give them IV, they will also get into your gut and into your lumen. So many of the IV antibiotics will have impact on the gut sorry, on the gut flora also. But in general, uh, the oral uh, medications will have more impact. Thank you. Um, what about, what is your opinion of drinking apple cider vinegar and water? Is it safe and are there any studies that show that it has a positive effect on the microbiome? Peter, that one is for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, there's definitely no data that particularly links apple cider vinegar um, to improvement in the microbiome. Um, I particularly don't uh, tell my patients to take apple cider vinegar. I think it also tastes pretty crummy for you to take. Um, so I would never ask you, um, especially if you're experiencing a lot of symptoms, to intake something that has not any proven benefit. Um, so that's to say I don't necessarily think apple cider vinegar will have any harm. I don't know that you're doing yourself any benefit uh, by taking a little bit of a kind of painful drink of something that isn't so tasty. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, what about there's someone here who had a bone marrow transplant last year and has had a constant rash that persists. They're wondering if diet really can help them with that rash. That's very difficult to say. Um, as you heard from a Peter, uh, a rash certainly longer out from bone marrow transplantation. The first thing that we're thinking of is still a graft versus host. So I, my first answer is that that needs to be carefully looked at by his or her a doctor. Um, can it be linked to certain food products? Yes, there are food allergies, of course. There are also drug allergies. Those are all pretty high on the list that needs to be ruled out uh, first. If the diet can be used to make it better, I think only by uh, avoiding a food allergy. I don't see clear evidence how it could otherwise uh, help. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll, um, I'll just quickly add that um, the other thing with along with GVHD that um, can manifest in your skin is some deficiency of certain vitamins or minerals. Yeah. So mm -hmm. as part of the whole package of looking at what's really happening with your skin from a nutrition perspective and you're talking with your doctor, that's something else that you'll want to kind of raise is some of the similar symptoms that you have from GBHD could also be due to a deficiency in certain vitamins which may be lost either due to poor intake or lost through diarrhea and things like that. 
But what about, um, Lewis writes us, does modified fasting, um, is there any research showing whether it helps uh, the flora? So I'm not really aware of that. Um, and I would argue, as you heard from Peter also, that within the context of an allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, uh, we rather see you do the opposite, right? As Peter outlined, try to have frequent meals and uh, make sure that your calorie intake, for instance, is uh, enough. So I think fasting doesn't have a major role um, in the whole therapy, in the whole regimen for an allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. Thank you. What about how long does it take post allo transplant for one's microbiome to try to return to normal if they're doing some of these things that um, you're mentioning, keeping their, their intake in? And um, any thoughts? Yeah, so we have actually studied that. I didn't have time to show all of that data. But that data was rather sobering. Um, what it indicated is that even patients who did really well, who after the bone marrow transplantation didn't need any type of antibiotics anymore, didn't need to be hospitalized for anything anymore, their diversity about a year out was finally back to where it should be, but the composition of the flora was still not completely normal. Um, so it can take a long time, it can take months before you get back to where you were. Thank you. Mark writes, does transplant donor's DNA change or affect the recipient's response to microbiome? Fantastic question um, that we're trying to study also in mouse models. So far, we haven't seen much impact on what the DNA, uh, so the HLA, for instance, of the donor, how that would impact. But we can't really rule that out, so we need some more studies. Very. Very good question. Oh, yes. Okay. Do organic foods generate more microbiota than non-organic foods? Peter, do you want to take that one? Sure, I can take that one. So I would say that there really aren't any um, data out there that say yes or no to that question. So I can't with 100% confidence say um, no, but I would say my uh, inclination is to say that it doesn't make a big difference as the organic or non-organic source, um, especially because the big difference between organic and non-organic is uh, potentially some exposure to pesticides, um, but um, in other types of uh, treatments of fruits, vegetables, other types of foods. Uh, but none of those should have a really significant impact on your microbiota when you are thinking about this in the larger picture. Great, thank you. Uh, someone also asked about comorbidities that can affect a transplant patient um, or previous smokers, blood pressure, things like that. Does that affect the biome or the microbiome? Um, yeah, we need to know more about that. Um, it certainly will have some impact, uh, but at the moment we have too little data to really understand uh, how that could impact. What we do know, and I don't think that I completely emphasize that, is that the state of your microbiome when you come into transplant, so the first time that we measure it, we have already evidence that having a lower diversity to start with sets you up for worse outcomes. Um, so these factors that were just mentioned from other studies, from non-transplant studies, we do know that uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension can have impact on the flora. How that really pans out within the context of an allogeneic transplant, we don't really know. But we do know that going into transplant with a more diverse flora is a good thing. Thank you. Alexander writes, why do you use lactose restriction when the patients have diarrhea? Wouldn't you want them to have more food options to encourage them to eat? We avoid using it at our facility because it restricts, um, or we avoid using it at our facility because it restricts a large portion of our menu to the patients. Um, 
I'm thinking that probably they're just concerned. So what does lactose do in everything with diarrhea? So maybe that Peter and I can both tackle this. Um, let me first tell you something about a study that we actually did um, where we showed that um, in some patients with the loss of the uh, diversity, sometimes your flora can be taken over by a single bacteria, right? So you go from having a rainforest almost with, with hundreds of different types of uh, bacteria to having a monoculture within your gut of just one. That's enterococcus. And when we analyze what are the factors that lead to that dominance, um, that monoculture of enterococcus, one of them was lactose, because that's a, a bacteria that specifically feeds, that is being nurtured by lactose. So then we try to understand, so why is that even in people who don't have a lactose intolerance, why do they still get that blooming of enterococcus? And when we analyzed that further, also in mouse models, what we noticed is that um, the lining of the gut where normally you should be making lactase, which is the enzyme that breaks down the lactose and should keep those levels within the gut relatively low, that if the lining of the gut is damaged from, for instance, a graft versus host or from the chemotherapy, the lactase levels are lower, the lactose levels go up, and therefore enterococcus starts to bloom. In mouse models, what we could do now is put, um, put mice on a lactose-free diet, and in that way we got less of the blooming of enterococcus and less graft-versus-host, because that monoculture of enterococcus, both in mouse and man, if that happens, sets you up for a greater risk for graft-versus-host. So that's a long answer, but basically telling you those lactose levels might go up because you make less lactase uh, because of damage to your gut, that can lead to the blooming of a bacteria, enterococcus, that is linked to graft versus host. But maybe Peter can give another uh, perspective also about uh, lactose and lactase. Yeah, so thanks, Marcel. I think that was a very good scientific side of it, and I can speak more from the clinical side, is, um, you know, to clarify, we don't restrict lactose exclusively in every single patient that has a bout of diarrhea. It's particularly for these patients who have this really uncontrollable diarrhea secondary to their uh, graft versus host disease that um, that lactose can really cause uh, some more of those symptoms of diarrhea, as Marcel mentioned, because of the uh, kind of uh, mucosa damage and things like that. Um, and to address the kind of restrictiveness of that diet, um, we certainly have lactose-free products here at the hospital, and we also um, really have constructed a diet that, um, that really uh, provides the patients as many options as possible and also as many things as possible related to um, increasing their calorie intake despite the use of or despite the lack of access to lactose-containing products. Um, so we've really kind of tried to answer that question by saying, okay, we know they don't need lactose, um, they may hurt their symptoms, but also what are some other options we can give them? What are some helpful alternatives to really still keep their protein and calorie intake up? Um, so there's a little bit of a kind of negotiation there because we agree that we don't want them to lose weight, um, our patients at the hospital, but we do also not want to exacerbate their diarrhea. Thank you, Peter. Um, I have Susan here who She's not quite clear on why the, the change in gut flora increases the risk of GVHD and how great is the increased risk. Could you kind of maybe uh, try to tackle that one? Sure. So that's, um, that's a very difficult question because we're still trying to figure out what are all of the mechanisms. Well, there are probably several that we know of already. One is um, when you're when the diversity within your forum changes, the first bacteria that you lose are those are commensal bacteria. Those are the ones that are making those short-chain fatty acids, which I mentioned also in my talk. Those short-chain fatty acids are direct nutrients, food, for the lining of your gut. So in other words, if you start to lose your commensal flora, 
your lining of your gut, so your, your cells that make up that barrier, they start to suffer. So that's one mechanism. A mechanism that we think is probably even more relevant is that we know that uh, bacteria regulate um, immunity. And some bacteria will activate the cells that can lead to a graft versus host. Others will dampen them. So if you start to lose some of the bacteria that can dampen the activation of, for instance, uh, T cells that are causing a graft versus host, that will accelerate the uh, graft versus host. I want to emphasize that how we look at the flora is that it modulates things. It's not the primary cause. I, I don't want to uh, overemphasize what the role is of the flora. It is important, but mostly as a modulator of a process such as a graft versus host that finds its causes and its roots uh, in something else. So those are just two of the possible mechanisms by which changes in the flora can make graft versus host uh, worse. I could talk about a whole bunch of other ones that we are studying currently in mouse models, but these are probably two of the big ones. Thank you, doctor. Um, this one, Peter, I think is for you. If you were a shopper for someone, um, is there, like, what kinds of things would you recommend, recommend them buying? I know you've said diversity, but they're asking, like, which foods are ones that really just are good at promoting that good bacteria? So it's a great question, and I wish that I had this kind of magic shopping list that I could distribute to all of my patients. Um, unfortunately, we aren't really there yet with the kind of perfect food list, if you will. So I think to really kind of drive home the point that both Marcel and I are kind of continuing to echo is um, really the best thing that you can do for your microbiotal diversity, especially in the transplant recovery process, is to make sure that you're maintaining calorie intake um, to make sure that you're uh, intaking as many foods as possible. And when we talk about diversity of foods, it's really getting foods from a variety of different sources. So fruits and vegetables and whole grains um, and different types of protein, really kind of keeping uh, that diversity of foods up, so really changing the types of foods that you're putting in your body um, in order to really make sure that you're kind of nourishing the gut in that way. Um, and as Marcel mentioned, there are some data around um, prebiotic foods, which are the food for our bacteria. Um, however, uh, there aren't really clear uh, studies just yet that, that prebiotic foods really, really benefit um, in the transplant population. And right now, um, certainly things like yogurt and things like that are beneficial, um, but the yogurt with the live cultures and things like that, that could be more probiotic foods, right now we haven't really deemed that they're safe in the um, post-transplant period while you're um, still going through some treatment and you're still immunosuppressed for about uh, 100 days. Uh, and so we uh, kind of stray away from some of those probiotic foods per se, it's like types of those uh, more active culture yogurts per se. Um, but we would uh, definitely recommend that sort of kind of keeping that mixed bag of foods um, available. So, um, you know, when you're looking at your cart at the grocery store, just make sure you don't have all kind of grains or all meat and, you know, protein, but you're really kind of picking items from a variety of different categories of foods. Can I just add something to that? So um, some of the studies that actually Peter did, um, and he mentioned it also, is that he found that the calorie intake, right, immediately drops when somebody is uh, hospitalized. So almost everybody who is going through an allogeneic uh, transplant at one point will really benefit from some of these energy drinks, Ensure, Boost, and so on. What I've seen centers do, and I actually think it's a good strategy, is to have people before the transplant. Uh, pick from a whole menu, a panoply of those kind of drinks, what are the ones that you really, really like? Are you more an Ensure fan or a Boost fan? And which flavors? And then um, acquire that taste, know what these, what, which, ones, which ones you like, which ones you don't like, or which ones you can uh, tolerate, for, because probably most of them nobody likes, but at least the one that you can uh, tolerate. And then you know, once the time comes, that you need some extra calories, which ones, which ones to go to. And that might be really helpful when 
you don't feel like eating and drinking and you don't want to go through a whole trial and error of different types of uh, drinks. So that's a very practical thing that I've seen done at some centers and I think is a very worthwhile strategy. Thank you. I'm going to ask just a couple quick ones and then we're going to conclude for today. Uh, again, I apologize if we didn't get to your questions. Um, this is definitely a popular topic. Uh, but both of your thoughts on uh, suggested digestive enzymes, do you even think digestive enzymes do much? Peter, why don't you take that one? Sure. So um, there's a bunch of different digestive enzymes on the market, and I don't have a favorite one. Um, that will really be just one of the many things that are kind of part of the equation when you're considering some of your stool quality and also some of your um, uh, diarrhea symptoms and things like that that you might be having during chronic GVHD. So it's something to definitely discuss with your doctor if you have had these symptoms for quite some time. And typically, if your stools are a little bit more oily and really smelly, um, to consider the use of those digestive enzymes, and there's quite a few on the market, so it'll depend really on your insurance, and those that are available for your um, different, on the formulary of the, your uh, hospital or um, at your pharmacy, um, and there really is no best one per se. They just have a different amount of uh, these enzymes within them to really help uh, with whatever you're intaking. So that's a definitely a follow-up question for your doctor depending on what you have available. I have nothing to add. All right, and last question today. Do you have any data or insight on patients who maybe receive TPM before or after versus those who continue to take by mouth throughout the process? It's a very good point. Um, I think as you can probably um, gather from all of the data that we have shown you that um, a major advantage of t getting your energy, getting your food orally versus putting it straight into your into your veins, um, that you maintain your flora. So the preference that most of us have is to try to make sure that you keep on uh, having oral intake, that you keep on eating um, in whatever way you can do it, smaller portions, whatever. Um, there are currently studies being done where people place a naso, nasogastric tube um, and try to find out if that would be of some benefit, for instance, for your flora, and then in an indirect way, uh, lessen the risk for graft versus host. Those studies are still ongoing, so, so we don't know. We can't say that for certain, but I think most doctors will definitely agree on try to avoid uh, TPN. TPN also has certain risks because you're putting food and needles and, and the tubes into somebody's veins That's, that always has certain risks um, and try to uh, promote and help as much as you can with oral intake. Okay, thank you. Well, again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, I know I certainly learned quite a bit, and I hope you did too. And our speakers, we just certainly can't thank you enough. You both are just a wealth of information, and, and I appreciate how you bring the information in a way we can all understand. Uh, and, of course, thank you to our sponsors, our partners. You make everything we do possible, and we just can't thank you enough for doing that. For everyone on this call today, uh, please pause before exiting the program to enter uh, a brief survey to help us just better serve you in the future with these educational programs. But again, thank you to you all, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Conference. All parties may disconnect. Have a good day.